Happy Halloween, everybody. Cousin It here at Triple B. Today's guest is Mr. Jay Summers, and he has bred more species in captivity than I think just about anybody else. Nobody fact-checked me on that last time, so I'm gonna go with it. We're gonna show you some of the animals he's produced and some of the animals he's kept. You're watching Triple B TV. thing is that I, I interviewed one, one time before. Yeah, like a couple years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was just cruising around doing like, yeah. I didn't have a booth or anything set up. Yeah, I was yeah, running yeah, around getting things and you yeah. had the Hellbender on the table. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, dude, this guy's got a Hellbender yeah. on his table. Nobody had anything yeah. like that around yeah. here. And that was, and that was the cool thing about it. It's like you, I think you were one of the only people that had just brought an animal just for the purpose of People never get to see it. People never get to see it. If I don't bring it, they won't get to see one. Right, right. And that was like that was your purpose. I liked that. It was yeah. every, you know, the majority of people here to try and sell an animal. You right. were just here like, look at this. Have you I seen one of these? I don't sell anything. Right. No, it just exposes them to an animal they wouldn't get to see. You've been doing it for a long time. 30 years. Yeah. You, you started breeding when you were like, what, 12? 14. 14? Yeah. Well, what do you think has changed the most in, from well, when I mean, you first started to now? Like, what's the... There's societal changes which affect this hobby and this industry. The animals have changed and the reasoning behind people keeping them have changed. Uh, there wasn't an investment potential in animals back then. I mean, people who did it did it mostly as a hobby because they were passionate about it or they loved what they do. And making a living on it was something most people didn't think of. The guys that made livings at it were like the big wholesale importers like Crutchfield and Strictly and those guys that bring in large quantities and wholesale everything out fast. And the people who bred them, bred them because they love the animals. And now, uh, I think a lot of people are interested in the animals, but they also look at it as like a fun way to make money, which is why it's kind of like a revolving door because they didn't start out with the foundation of passion for the animals. It was kind of an interest, but it wasn't like a drive that is embedded in them like from a kid. And then, you know, so people burn out. I see a lot of people come and go. The old school guys are all, retiring and getting out of it in the last few years. Uh, but I also see a lot of things that were popular disappear and then come back again and then disappear. A lot of Australian stuff does that. It's like, oh, I got something new and rare. And it's like, yeah, there were people breeding those 20 years ago here, you know? But everything blows up, the market gets saturated. There's a finite number of people interested in obscure things that are not like boa constrictors or leopard geckos, anything that's on the, like a more obscure species. Uh, there's just a finite number of people that have interest in them because they don't have the attributes to make them like a pet trade staple, right, right. like a leopard gecko does or a bearded dragon. You know, so if they're not something that has broad ranging viability in the pet trade, then once the people that want them have them, the market's dead. And it takes like a little while for it to kind of resurrect itself. You know, so there's definitely a cycle in that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, because I, I haven't been in it long enough to, I mean, yeah. I've been keeping sexes size four, but I didn't know about this. I was just like... Look, I, I mean, we used to order animals out of the back of a magazine and send money orders and checks to people, and you had to wait for that to clear, and then they send it to you. And you had long-distance phone bills that were $500 a month because we didn't have internet, we didn't have email, and we certainly didn't have FaceTime and texting, right. you know? So there's that. Social media has done a lot of good for the hobby, and kind of amplified some of the bad in the hobby too. You know, it's made the world a very small place. Right. And right. it's also given people cover to kind of conceal some of the bad aspects of their humanity. So there's a lot of that. You can kind of create a false perception of who you are online. You know? yeah. So there's yeah. that. And it used to be you had to meet people face to face and you hung out, you know, you went to symposiums and then did a lot of exchanging that way. And people that used to breed the same things were actually friends, whereas now they're competition. Yeah. That's changed. That's a big change I've seen. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, for me, I, I didn't get that whole perspective because I, again, when I was keeping, when I was a kid, when I was four and I got my first snake and then uh, they're growing up with them, I didn't know there was this whole thing. Yeah. I just thought I was one, right. one weird kid that had snakes. Yeah. I didn't realize, I had no idea there was a, a community or a herpetoculture thing yeah. going on out there. Yeah. And I just, in the past, well, I mean, the first a... time I saw you was probably when I was just realizing yeah. there was this yeah. community right. of it. And, now there's a, I mean, there's a couple of people you can thank for the evolution of the hobby as uh, a way to make a living. Like Bob Clark, he's a big one that comes to mind. Some other people too. Uh, like Bob at Sandfire Dragon Ranch, 
But, you know, Bob Clark took a huge risk, bought a really expensive snake. Everybody thought he was crazy. He bred it and he made a lot of money. And that kind of changed the whole landscape of investing money in animals to make a profit, as opposed to buying an expensive animal because you thought it was cool, you know? Right. So that changed, that definitely changed the game, big time. Gotcha. That'd be mid late, mid 80s, you know, mid late 80s. So. What do you see from your experience, like, say, 10, 10 years from now? What, what, how do you see things um, changing? I think that uh, the hobby as a whole, uh, is going to have to make some serious changes and self-regulate and kind of lead the dance on that instead of uh, playing catch up to what other people are trying to establish. Uh, or you're going to really restrict pet ownership here uh, and accessibility to animals and the ability to import and export. You know, So that's going to change. Uh, I think that uh, as attitudes change about keeping animals, the responsibility is going to have to be elevated. I think that captive breeding is going to have to increase, not just for the animals that are already established, like bearded dragons, certain chameleons, but if people want to see a wide variety of species, people are going to have to start figuring out how to breed these things. Because once the imports stop, you'll never see them again if people are not captive breeding. Them. Right. So, but I see a lot of things improving. People have kind of uh, gotten into the interactive nature of having some of these animals, which is not really what I do. I don't pet my animals much. The hobby's evolved a lot. People take it more seriously and more responsibly. And I, I see a lot of uh, trends where people are setting up animals, not necessarily naturalistically, but at least not on newspaper with, you know, a cat litter box with a cover over it or something, you know. People are getting more into that, which is good. A lot of caging options are coming around that are a lot nicer than just a 10 gallon aquarium with a screen top. Yeah. So yeah. that helps, you know, so. And that's cyclical too. I mean, I, there was a big push 20 years ago for people to have terrariums and nice furniture quality enclosures. And then everybody drifted into freedom breeders and all these melamine cages that are just functional and not really aesthetically pleasing. And now it's kind of coming back to people wanting more than that. Not that there's anything wrong with those cages, but they're not something someone would put in their living room. Right, right, right. Now people have to understand that the main driving part of this market is not other breeders. It's 15, 16, 18, 25 year old people who want one or two cool pets for their room or their living room, you know? It's, people don't want a whole room of snakes. I mean, that's not the norm. Right, Just right. because you're in a bubble at the reptile show or surrounded by people that the, do that, that doesn't mean the norm, that the rest right. of the people, I mean, there's a lot of reptiles in captivity, and a lot of people have one or two or three, right. not a whole garage. That's how it was my whole life growing right. up. Yeah, I didn't have it. Right. And that's the market, you know? I like that. You got some, can we check out the animals? Yeah, I just brought a couple of things. Uh, I didn't vend this year, but I brought some things that people won't get an opportunity to see. These don't like to be held very much, but uh, these are New Zealand green gecko. Wow. That's a live bearing species from New Zealand. It's uh, heavily regulated, heavily protected. I'm um, the only person that's ever imported them with CITES documents legally into the U.S. The Holy Grail gecko, you know. I've never seen anything like no. it. Not in person. Yeah. So this is a high white representative, and then I brought an all green one with no pattern. Oh, look at they that have, face. Yeah, they have purple mouths, and they use it as a threat display. So this is a patternless green animal. Wow. The Naltinus gray eye, the northern green gecko. It's in the North Island in New Zealand. That's the place. I, have you gone herping out that, that way? Not in New Zealand. Not New Zealand. But a lot of other places. If you're going to go on another herping trip, like... If I wanted to go right now, I uh, probably would like to go to Borneo or maybe Equatorial South America, Ecuador, Peru, stuff like that. Take it out. Yeah, yeah. that'd be sweet, man. That'd be, that's on my list of where I would be most focused on going for the types of animals or the Philippines if I could arrange export permits. Gotcha. Yeah. Philippines is got a lot of animals. Philippines is cool, but really I got a lot cool of family animals. over there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, so. got a, I got a girlfriend who has a lot of family over there. Nice. <laughs> That'll help. That'll help big time. Yes, it does help. <laughs> so I wouldn't go to the Philippines if I didn't have people there that I knew I could go to. Yeah, that's an important current situation over there. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. You know? No doubt. Yeah. But, yeah. AJ, I, I appreciate you no taking problem, the time man. to talk to us yeah, today, man. for sure. Seriously. Absolutely. I hope you guys enjoyed that. You can probably find them at the uh, Reptile Super Shows. That's where I always seem to find them. Next week, we're going to be talking with our friend Javier at JRG Reptiles. Until then, you've been watching Triple B TV. Y'all take care. How's it going, guys? Triple... Happy Halloween, everybody. Cousin It coming to you. 
We're gonna show you some of the animals he's produced, some of the animals he's kept. I hope that... Next week we're gonna be talking with our friend Gia... Boys! We're all good, rolling, rolling, rolling. Um, how is that thing recording right now? Okay, I was, I had, a, sorry, I had a minute where this is, this is like supposed to be plugged into it, but it's still on. So I'll pull yeah. out, we're gonna get some B-roll. Wherever you wanna do. Yeah, those. just, just like right Like I here. said, I'll, I'll send you some pics of some other like oddball stuff that I okay. don't, that other people don't breed, things like that, that are interesting the way they breed. Yeah, I'll send you a picture nice. of a hellbender if you want. Like, okay, I'll get one I still out. got the footage too of that. Yeah, okay, that cool. One, so. yeah.